All right, so the second part of chapter 42 is going to focus on the gas exchange, um, how our cells are able to get the oxygen they need to be able to perform cellular respiration and remove the carbon dioxide um, that is generated. Um, gases diffuse um, just like we talked about water with osmosis. Um, in terms of gases, they're going to diffuse from regions of higher partial pressure to regions of lower partial pressure. You may remember from your chemistry days that partial pressure is the pressure exerted by a gas that is present in a mixture of gases. So gases are going to diffuse down gradients. We saw this with ions as well. Um, they're going to diffuse down pressure gradients in the lungs as well as other organs due to these differences in partial pressure. So if the air that you are inhaling has more oxygen in it than where that oxygen is, um, go, where the air is going to, then the oxygen would move into those particular cells. And if it had less than you, if, let's say with carbon dioxide, then the carbon dioxide would come out um, because there would be a greater amount of carbon dioxide um, in the lungs that would be moving out into um, that air or into the blood. Um, animals can use both air or water. It's obviously going to depend on what adaptations that have taken place to get their oxygen. Um, know that there is definitely way less oxygen in water than there is in air. And that in order to get oxygen from water, you have to have a different type of efficiency. You have to have greater efficiency than just taking in air um, through your nose or mouth. Sorry. Um, animals are going to require large, moist respiratory surfaces um, so that these gases can get exchanged. So we're talking about changing phases. The gas obviously is going to be um, moving in to a liquid environment and vice versa. Um, and then, or in the case of water, obviously it'd be a liquid, liquid environment. Um, gas exchange is going to take place as we talked about by diffusion. Um, respiratory surfaces are going to vary. You could be your outer surface, your skin, your gills, your trachea, or your lungs. So gills are the outfoldings of the body. They're going to give you a greater surface area for those gases to be exchanged. Um, ventilation moves that respiratory medium over the respiratory surface, in this case, the gills. Um, aquatic animals are able to move through water to get their ventilation, and they use a countercurrent exchange. We talked about this earlier. Um, blood basically moves in the opposite direction of the water moving over, and wherever the blood interacts with the water, it's always going to have less oxygen, allowing it to take up more oxygen as that water passes over it. All right, so those are some examples of gills or um, adaptations that function as gills. And if you look down in this bottom right-hand corner, you will notice that whether you have oxygen, I don't really get the whole um, running opposite. I think it's more of a perpendicular. But as the water moves across um, the blood vessels, you will notice that the partial pressure of oxygen in the water is always greater than the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood no matter whether it's oxygen rich or oxygen poor. And so that allows the oxygen to continue to diffuse across those blood vessels. Um, tracheal system um, for insects uses these little tiny branching tubes that go throughout the body and they take oxygen directly to the blood cells. So their respiratory and circulatory systems are not um, intermingled. Um, and depending on the size of your insect, they may need to ventilate to get um, their oxygen needs. Okay, so there you can see kind of the air sacs. Lungs are infoldings of the body's surface. No matter whether you have an open or closed circulatory system, gases are transported between the lungs and the rest of the body. Um, how big your lungs are, how complex they are, will depend on your metabolic needs. Um, branching ducts will bring the air to the lungs. It is inhaled through your nostrils where it's warm, humidified. You are able to tell if there's odors attached to it. The pharynx takes the air and directs it to the lungs um, via the trachea, while the food that it takes in goes to the stomach, um, protecting it from going into the trachea via the epiglottis. We talked about that before. So 
before it actually gets to the trachea, it's going to pass over the larynx. Um, once it gets into the trachea, it's eventually going to move into the bronchi and then the bronchioles and to its final destination, which is the alveoli. That's where you're going to see these gases exchange um, with the cells. Um, um, when air passes over your vocal cords in the larynx, that's how you get your sounds. And um, this is pretty well. Cilia and mucus line your air ducts so they can help to move particles that should not be in your lungs up to the far pharynx. Um, this mucus escalator helps to clean out your respiratory system and can allow things to be swallowed into the esophagus and then digested accordingly. So the gas exchange takes place in the alveoli, these air sacs. Um, Oxygen is going to move through the moist film of the epithelium into the capillaries there. And then the carbon dioxide is going to move in the opposite direction. So the air is going to have a greater partial pressure of oxygen in it, while the capillaries are going to have a greater percentage of carbon dioxide. Um, alveoli don't have cilia. Um, so they don't have ways to get rid of um, materials that should not be there. They're much, um, they, they are more susceptible to being contaminated. Um, they secrete surfactants um, that help to coat them. It makes it so that um, they don't build up as great of a surface pressure. So they're not as likely to collapse. Um, when you are a preterm baby, you have not necessarily yet generated your own surfactant. And so that can cause a host of respiratory issues. Um, so if you are likely to be born uh, prematurely, they will prov um, provide the mother with artificial surfactants um, to help or chemicals that will help to get those surfactants going so that preterm babies will have a better um, chance of breathing on their own. All right. So the picture on the left, you see the different components making up the respiratory system of the human. Um, sorry, swallowing issues. We see the blood moving, um, the oxygen poor blood from the pulmonary artery moving into the respiratory system, reaching the alveoli. And then we see once that blood has been oxygenated, that it is leaving um, the alveoli via the capillaries. Um, through the pulmonary vein to go back into the heart on the left ventricle side, whereas the blood that came in to the um, lungs that was oxygen poor came from our right ventricle. All right, and so the alveoli, again, is the site of where we have all these gases exchange. So how do we ventilate our lungs? By breathing, by taking in, inhaling, and letting go of air, exhaling. Amphibians um, will ventilate their lungs, frogs do, by positive pressure breathing, basically forcing the air to come down. And that's what we're seeing happen um, right now a lot in the hospital with COVID-19 patients. Um, birds have eight or nine air sacs um, that function as bellows that keep the air moving through their lungs. The air only goes in one direction. And every time they exhale, they have a new set of air in their lungs. Okay. So first inhalation takes in the air, then you've got the air sacs, that gets the air to the lungs, and then when you have inhaled the second time, you have set that air back out. We take in our air, mammals do, by negative pressure breathing. So rather than air being pushed in, we pull the air in. Um, and this too goes back to gas loss. Um, your lung volume increases as your rib muscles and your diaphragm contract. Um, so, and I'll show you some pictures of this on the next side. The tidal volume is how much air you take in, the, the amount of air, the volume that you inhale. And however much total air you could take in is considered to be your vital capacity. There will always be a little bit of air left in your lungs when you exhale. You're not going to exhale all of the air out. So we said negative pressure. When you have contracted your diaphragm, that would be the one on the right, uh, that is going to reduce your volume and increase your pressure and push the air back out. When you take the air in, 
you have a larger volume, you have a smaller pressure, and that's going to what's going to cause um, the air to come in willingly. Okay. So your rib cage gets smaller when you're exhaling. Again, you're reducing your volume. It expands when you're inhaling. You're increasing your volume, which is reducing the pressure. There are um, a couple of regions in the brain, uh, one major one, and then there's an assist by the pons that help to control breathing, the medulla oblongata and the pons. The medulla is what's able to regulate how often you should breathe and how deeply you should breathe. It does this based on signals from the cerebrospinal fluid, sorry, cerebrospinal fluid. Um, also has to do with your pH since carbon dioxide can help to lower your pH, make you more acidic. And also depends on what you're doing, your metabolic needs. And then the pons, again, it just is, um, helps with the regulation of that. There are sensors in your aorta and your carotid arteries, the sources of your higher pressure um, that monitor those oxygen and CO2 concentrations. And they too can play a role as kind of a backup measure over breathing. So depending on what's going on, if you start to have an increase in CO2, um, you need to get some of that CO2 out of your um, body. Um, you've got sensors that are going to go off that help to recognize that you need to exhale. Um, and so you will see your ribs and your diaphragm increase how often you're ventilating and how deeply you're ventilating to help to remove some of that CO2 out and get the blood pH back to where it needs to be. So there are adaptations that have taken place to help to promote this gas and exchange, make it more effective, um, depending on what type of organism you are and the metabolic demands you have. You may need to get a lot of oxygen um, in and to your cells and a lot of CO2 out. Um, we've talked about how the pressures um, will play a role, the, the blood arriving in the lungs. Um, again, the blood in the lungs is not oxygenated as it arrives, and so it's got a lot of CO2 compared to that oxygen, um, especially if we look at it compared to the air that's present. So because of that difference in partial pressure, um, oxygen moves from the air into um, the alveoli, into the blood, and CO2 is able to exhale, or sorry, CO2 does not exhale, CO2 diffuses out of the blood um, into the air. When we deal with this in terms of tissues, we see a similar thing where the oxygen level, partial pressures in the interstitial fluids is lower than the oxygen levels uh, of what the blood that's coming to it. And we see that CO2 levels are greater in the interstitial fluid. So the CO2 part, um, gas is able to diffuse across into the blood. Right. And that's just kind of showing you a picture of that process happening. Um, things are always going to move from a higher level with oxygen and carbon dioxide to a lower level or diffuse across from higher to lower pressures. There are respiratory pigments, um, different proteins that help to increase how much oxygen our blood gets. Um, we use hemoglobin, but arthropods and mollusks use hemocyanin that's got copper um, to bind to the oxygen. Um, our hemoglobin is found as vertebrates in our erythrocytes, our red blood cells. Each hemoglobin, as we've talked about previously, can hold up to um, four oxygen molecules. And if there is, we'll see a, a graph of this, a hemoglobin association curve will show you that if there is a slight change in partial pressure of oxygen, that can have a pretty significant change in how much oxygen um, is able to be released. Um, carbon dioxide that's produced as a part of cellular respiration, again, it's acidic, it's going to reduce your pH. And when it does that, it also decreases ox um, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. Um, so that's called what we, that's commonly called the Bohr shift. So you can see the difference in the partial pressures. Those are on your x-axis on the graph of the left and how that changes how much oxygen is being taken up by the hemoglobin molecules. And then in the graph on the right, you can see by lowering the pH by just 0.2 um, at 60 millimeters of mercury, you've gone from having almost 90% oxygen saturation down to 80. Um, and But that across the board, no matter what partial pressure you are at, the percent saturation has diminished.
Um, hemoglobin doesn't just help us out with oxygen. It also helps us out with CO2 because, again, CO2 is going to make things more acidic, and that's going to have an impact on the homeostasis of our pH in our blood. Um, so it does help to transport that CO2, um, again, because of the diffusion that's taking place. Um, it can either do that by binding it to hemoglobin or by taking it up as bicarbonate ions and just transporting those um, elsewhere out of the cells. And then finally, something about diving animals. Um, there's evolutionary adaptations that have allowed them to be able to stay underwater for significant periods of time. Um, why are they able to do that? One, they have lots of blood in their bodies um, compared to their volumes. And so if they happen to be a particular organism that dives um, for extended periods of time, they will obtain lots of oxygen and then just let it go in small amounts. Um, they can also store it in myoglobin proteins, and they can conserve their oxygen by trying to avoid using it actively, focusing on more passive transport, or using anaerobic means of obtaining ATP.